Hello friends, this is Grief speaking. Today we're going to be looking at The Worst Video Game Iceberg by Raging Rowan on Reddit. I know it's a little different than my usual MO since I typically cover creepy horror stuff, but hey, these games are so bad it's scary. Okay, edit that out. In reality, I'm working on some huge videos at the moment, including a remaster mega comp of the J-horror movie Iceberg, the Disturbing Books Iceberg, and some body horror and manga stuff as well. Some of these projects can take months to put together, and so in the meantime, I thought I could cover something fun, which is bad video games. Anyway, this is a big one, so let's just get right into it. Shout out again to Raging Rowan for creating the Iceberg, but without further ado, the worst video games Iceberg. Tier 1 Big Rigs. Big Rigs Over the Road Racing is a 2003 racing video game for PC that has become notorious among gamers for being one of the worst video games of all time, with people even calling into question whether Big Rigs could actually be called a video game. There's no real physics in the game, so you just stay stuck to the ground even going up a steep cliff. You just pass through any buildings on the map, there's no limit to how fast you can go in reverse, there's no barrier to the edge of the map so you can just drive off into the gray void, and probably why this is most considered to not be a game at all is because your opponent, the other truck that you're supposedly racing, just doesn't move, meaning there's no challenge at all to winning. You can just drive all the way across the map and past the finish line, and the other truck will still be sitting there. So that's Big Rigs, most people know about it, but if you haven't, Ride to Hell Retribution Ride to Hell is a biker themed game released in 2013 and is widely regarded as one of the worst games of the 2010s. The game takes place in the 1960s and follows biker Jake Conway. He comes back from Vietnam to his brother being killed by a rival biker gang and seeks revenge. Along the way you get terrible riding coupled with worse acting, animation, and sound design. The overall game mechanics here are just bad, including the actual motorcycle riding which should have been the one thing they got right, but instead you're slip sliding around the road like your bike is made out of warm butter. I mean, I could go on, but basically every aspect of the game is done wrong. Level design, combat, everything. One really strange thing about the game that I just have to note because it's so bizarre is that there is an actual game mechanic here where you power up by sleeping with random women, and the way this happens is you encounter a woman being beaten, berated, or otherwise threatened by sexual assault, oftentimes by their husbands, and when you rescue them, they just sleep with you. I mean, what the hell? And the actual scenes are hilariously bad because the animations are so awkward, but for whatever reason, Jake and the women remain fully clothed the whole time. It doesn't make any sense, and the whole thing is just really weird. So yeah, Ride to Hell is a game that won't be forgotten anytime soon, and for the worst reasons. Action 52. Action 52 is an unlicensed game made for the NES that included 52 games in one cartridge. It was originally priced at $200, but hey, you get 52 games, so it's a steal. Except for the fact that all 52 games suck. It's mostly made up of side-scrolling space shooters and platformers, and they all feel very one-note. They just feel like something you'd play on a Flash game site in the early 2000s. Actually, that's probably giving them too much credit considering that a lot of the games didn't even work. The developer, Active Enterprises, actually advertised a content test over one game in particular, Ooze. If you completed level 6, you could enter into a drawing to win $100,000. The problem was, Ooze is broken and crashes every time on level 2. Man, that's actually a great evil scheme. Dangling 100 k out there to players who can never actually get it. Well, the Action 52's creme de la creme and most promoted game was the Cheetah Men. Yeah, the fucking Cheetah Men are here, guys. The Cheetah Men were planned to become the next Ninja Turtles, a big franchise with game sequels, comic books, cartoons, maybe even movies, but there's one big issue with this. The initial game, the Cheetah Men, you know, the one that introduces the Cheetah Men to the world, it sucks big balls, man. So yeah, that's Action 52. 52 horrible games in one cartridge for too high a price. Superman 64. There actually haven't been a lot of Superman games over the years, maybe because being indestructible makes Superman a difficult character to design a game around. But my favorite was easily Superman Returns. Being able to just fly at supersonic speeds across the open world of Metropolis was awesome, but the action and story felt a little lackluster. There just hasn't really been a perfect Superman game. 
but there has been a worse Superman game and one of the worst N64 games of all time. With a rushed development, Superman 64 was panned on almost every level of analysis. The graphics are bad, the levels suck, and Superman is notoriously hard to control. The game's first level requires flying through a series of rings, and if you miss too many, you lose. If you manage to make it through the rings, you're instantly thrown into an action sequence, and if you mess that up, you gotta start all over. I actually had this game as a kid and could never make it past the first level, so i just go to the practice mode, which actually worked kind of like a free roam. i just fly around aimlessly and use my freeze breath. It wasn't until years later I realized everyone else was having the same issues. E.T. E.T., the famously bad Atari 2600 game, has become a cautionary tale of rushed game development as it was made in only five weeks. It was such a commercial flop that it became synonymous with the video game industry crash of 1983. The game mostly suffered from confusing and frustrating game mechanics. Players controlled E.T. in a quest to collect pieces of an interplanetary telephone, but he would frequently fall into pits that were difficult to escape, leading to a repetitive and unenjoyable experience. The game's commercial failure was partly due to overly optimistic sales forecasts, which led to Atari producing millions more cartridges than there even were consoles to play them on. Legend has it that millions of unsold cartridges were buried in a New Mexico landfill, a story that was actually confirmed in 2014 when an excavation uncovered unsold copies, making it one of the most legendary games in video game history. Bubsy 3D Bubsy 3D released in 1996 for the PlayStation. The game attempted to bring the previously 2D Bubsy franchise into the third dimension, but it failed to compete with other 3D platformers like Super Mario 64 and Crash Bandicoot. Players criticized Bubsy 3D for its clunky controls, which made even simple movements and precision jumping exceedingly frustrating. The game's camera, as with a lot of these early 3D platforming games, was a big issue here, and visually it was unimpressive, featuring flat and simplistic textures that lacked the visual appeal of other games from the same period. All that on top of the fact that Bubsy himself just won't shut up and is really annoying led Bubsy 3D to be a commercial and critical failure, frequently appearing on lists of the worst games ever made. Now, if you lose a Bubsy, you'll start over here instead of at the beginning of the level. Hey, why it's great. Sonic the Hedgehog 2006. I've always found Sonic to be a really interesting franchise because Sonic remains one of the most identifiable and popular video game characters, but at the same time has had a terrible track record when it comes to his actual games. Rarely is there a Sonic game that is more than mediocre, and there are more than a few that are just plain bad. One of the most infamous of these is of course Sonic 06. Intended to be a soft reboot of the series, the game ended up tarnishing the Sonic brand with its multitude of issues. As with many of the games on the list, it was criticized for rush development, which led to a ton of issues, glitches, long load times, and another bad camera system that was uncooperative, frequently obscuring the player's view, contributing to unnecessary deaths. The game also introduced a convoluted storyline featuring a human hedgehog romance, which many fans thought was a little out of place in the Sonic universe. In fact, the whole game is a little odd in this way, with the world and characters being realistic looking, and then there's just Sonic, a cartoon hedgehog. But that wouldn't be all so bad if the character interactions weren't so awkward. Duke Nukem Forever Duke Nukem Forever released in 2011 after a notorious 14 year development cycle, which actually was the record for the longest game development until it was surpassed by Beyond Good and Evil 2 in 2022. The game was met with disappointment due to its outdated graphics, cumbersome controls, and prolonged load times, which contrasted sharply with the expectations of modern gamers. The design decision to limit weapon carrying capacity and the outdated humor just missed the mark. While originally intended to be a grand revival of the series, the game's unpolished mechanics and underdeveloped multiplayer component failed to recapture the charm of the original 90s games. I honestly think the game is just mediocre. I didn't think it was horrible, but I think a lot of why this is on the list is just the mass disappointment because the game was in development for so long and people were really looking forward to it. Too bad. Okay, we're moving into Tier 2. Flat Out 3, Chaos and Destruction. Flat Out 3 is to this day the worst rated racing game on Steam and in the top worst rated games of any category at all. I was a big fan of the original two Flat Out games, mostly because of the actual Flat Out mechanic where you could launch the driver out of the windshield. Yeah, it seems super mundane now, but at the time ragdoll physics were still fairly new, so watching a body fly through the air and smack into stuff seemed way more realistic than the typical falling animations we were used to. Well, little did I know that somewhere down the line a Flat Out 3 was released 
released, and as I said, it's now infamous for being one of the worst games on Steam. The game just stinks, there's no other way to say it. There's plenty of little things about it, like the bad and sometimes strange soundtrack, or the boring and unplayable game modes, but at the core, the racing just isn't fun. It doesn't even make sense because the first two games were known for their great physics and graphics, but somehow this one has taken a big step backwards. The physics are inconsistent and the graphics look completely outdated. I mean, look at this. It looks like ass. I was lucky enough to never know about this game, but I imagine flat out fans were extremely disappointed when they got their hands on it. The real reason is that the developers of the first two games didn't work on this one, and instead some other studio took the helm, forever tanking the franchise. Ball in Wonderworld, or maybe Ballon Wonderworld? Anyway, this game was released in 2021. It's worth noting that Balan's Wonderworld is an actual playable game, unlike Big Rigs or Superman or something. But like Duke Nukem, it just disappointed gamers, especially since the creative director, Yuji Naka, was highly esteemed, even helping create the Sonic the Hedgehog series. The game was mostly criticized for its simplistic and repetitive gameplay that just fell a little flat, with each of the characters' costumes providing a single ability that didn't even work that well and led to monotonous puzzle solving. Overall, the controls were just a little clunky and frustrating. The visuals and music aren't bad and are actually considered a highlight of this game, although they seem, along with the gameplay itself, to be heavily inspired by Mario Odyssey. The narrative is a little confusing as well, the idea being that you enter different worlds and unburden the hearts of the inhabitants. These worlds are within a musical theater-like dimension known as the Ball and Theater. I don't know, but when you finish a level, you get cutscenes like this. Yeah, it's worth it just for that. I mean, what the hell? Aliens Colonial Marines. This is another case of a hyped game that just didn't live up to the excitement. The concept of Colonial Marines sounds awesome. A cooperative shooter where players work together to survive an onslaught of aliens, with the story being an actual canon tie-in to the Aliens movie? That sounds like a dream game for Alien fans. Unfortunately, the game fell flat of expectations. The game's graphics and lighting were just a little wonky, other than a couple of levels and sequences, so it just failed to recreate the haunting ambiance that is synonymous with the Alien franchise. Plus, the AI wasn't great, which is something you just don't want in a horror game. I mean, you should be shitting your pants when the Xenomorphs approach, but the AI is so awkward, it just comes off comical at times. Speaking of AI, if you're not playing with friends, the AI teammates are almost useless, often getting in the way. The narrative and voice acting just kind of had B-movie vibes, so it was really hard to connect with the story there. There are people who still enjoyed this game, and there are elements of it that work pretty well, like the weapon customization, but overall, it just didn't live up to the hype. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 the Tony Hawk games have a less than stellar history overall. As most people know, the original two pro skater games were massive hits that actually contributed to skateboarding's resurging popularity. After Tony Hawk 4, the games took on a series of subtitled sequels like Tony Hawk's Underground and American Wasteland. Then there were some huge flops like Tony Hawk's Ride, which featured a real-life board trying to cash in on the uptick in motion controls, and the series came back to its roots, continuing the numbered sequels with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5. And boy, was everyone disappointed pointed mostly due to the lack of content. The game just feels empty and bland and took a huge step back for the series. Even the graphics look like PlayStation 2 era, and in that case, you should just go back and play any of the Tony Hawk games from that time because they're at least jam-packed with content and originality. GTA The Trilogy Definitive Edition. This one was a little controversial on the original Iceberg post, I think because the games themselves are actually good and it's more of a botched remaster here. But just to touch on it, the GTA Trilogy Definitive Edition was was following in the trend of remastering an old game rather than just making a good new game. But whatever, the thing didn't look as good as people would have hoped and was littered with bugs, leading to a horrendous launch which no one really expected. Night Trap Night Trap is an interactive movie game that was released for the Sega CD in 1992. The game is notable for its use of full motion video to present the narrative, which was cutting edge technology at the time. Players monitor a group of teenage girls during a sleepover at a house that is infiltrated by vampire-like creatures known as augers. So the player's job is to watch over the house through a series of surveillance cameras and trigger traps to capture the augers and protect the girls. There's a lot of issues with Night Trap. The most obvious is that it looks like crap, which 
we can forgive a little bit because it's of the time, but the main issue is the actual gameplay mechanics. There's a big conflict between stopping the augurs and actually seeing the story play out. If you watch the story scenes play out, you'll be wasting time and augurs will make their way into the house. This, with the fact that the game is pretty repetitive, makes it kind of frustrating. It's worth noting that the game became infamous for its controversial content, which was considered violent and sexually suggestive, although by modern standards, it's pretty tame. Honestly, the violence here feels a little more in league with Home Alone than an R-rated horror movie. Regardless, it was one of the games cited during congressional hearings in the United States in the early 90s that led to the creation of the Entertainment Software Rating Board, otherwise known as ESRB. Sonic Boom, Rise of Lyric. So we covered Sonic 06, but there is a more recent Sonic game that took a real beating by game critics. Sonic Boom sought to reinvent the series a bit, with the characters getting new fashion accessories because, you know, bandanas are cool, adding a new combat system, and focus on exploration and puzzle solving. Though, the puzzles aren't really puzzles, you just kind of hit switches and stuff. Plus, the characters tell you exactly what to do constantly. I get that they were trying to take a risk by branching out a bit, but it's a departure from the series' classic high-speed gameplay into a more sluggish experience that just didn't sit right with people. On top of that, there's a ton of technical issues, including bugs, glitches, and significant frame rate drops. The game's attempt at a more developed narrative and new aesthetic just fell flat, with many people finding the story unengaging and the environments lame. This combination of technical shortcomings and design missteps led to the game being considered yet another Sonic blunder. Lord of the Rings Gollum Speaking of recent games, this might be the most recent entry ever on an iceberg that I've covered. Golem came out in May 2023, and I have to say, I kind of saw this one coming. I remember when the first gameplay trailer for this came out a while back, and it just rubbed me the wrong way. I, I just knew it was going to be bad. Well, Golem was, of course, torn to pieces by critics for just being boring, outdated, unpolished, and for generally feeling unfinished. The game got such a bad reputation that the studio that made it, Daedalic Entertainment, closed down their development division and decided to focus only on publishing. Worse than that, many complaints came out from the now laid off employees that Daedalic was working them overtime without proper compensation, wasn't even paying them minimum wage, and had an all around abusive work environment. Yikes. Moving on to tier three, Nintendo CDI games. The Philips CDI was essentially created after a failed collaboration with Nintendo. The plan was to create a CD add-on to the Super Nintendo, but after this didn't pan out, Philips said screw it and made a standalone CD console themselves. Well, the console ended up being a flop as the system's high cost, inferior game library, and failure to compete with other gaming consoles of the era, like the PlayStation and Sega Saturn, ultimately led to its downfall. Although it never made the Super Nintendo add-on, it did manage to get licenses from Nintendo to make several CDI games based on both Mario and Zelda. These games gained a notorious reputation among gamers for their substandard graphics and awkward controls, particularly for the Zelda titles, which have laughable animated cutscenes with poor voice acting and animation quality. The fact that there exists not just subpar, but straight up bad Mario and Zelda games that are officially licensed is quite a shock when you first see them. The Quiet Man. The Quiet Man is an action-adventure game developed by Human Head Studios and published by Square Enix, released in 2018. It was kind of an interesting concept because the game's protagonist, Dane, is deaf, and the game attempted to convey his perspective by significantly muffling audio and removing subtitles for most of the game. The idea was to see the world from Dane's perspective, but it just left everyone confused because we have no idea what anyone is saying or what's going on. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. They actually take the dialogue out of the game. You're just watching people people's lips move. The other problem is that the game switches between live action cinematic segments and the actual 3D gameplay, which once again seems like a cool concept, but just doesn't really work in practice because the difference is so stark and it just keeps switching back and forth. Besides those glaring issues, the gameplay itself was clunky and lackluster, which isn't good when all the gameplay segments are combat based. On top of that, the game was criticized for its short length, which stood only at around three hours, making it feel more like an incomplete experiment than a fully fleshed out game. So yeah. Yeah, the quiet man was ambitious, but just didn't execute well on its ideas. Die Katana. Die Katana released for the Nintendo 64 in 2000, and the development was led by John Romero, who is a legend for being one of the co-creators of Doom. It was meant to be a groundbreaking first-person shooter, but after a long development period, it was finally released to complete disappointment. The game suffered from outdated graphics and poor level design, which were particularly glaring given the advances in the FPS genre at the time. The AI wasn't great either, as the player sidekicks were notorious for their lack of helpful behavior, often getting in your way more than helping you, most 
mostly due to the fact that you need your sidekick with you at the end of a level in order to complete it and if your sidekick dies it's game over so instead of having a badass team blowing through enemies you have to babysit them as if every level is an escort mission i will say though there is a hilarious game over screen when you die <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye! <laughs> Bro. I mean, come on, that's funny. The game was actually released on PC as well, which makes a lot more sense, but usually when people are talking about the game, they're referring to the N64 version, which had a worse visual quality and frame rate issues. Plus, let's face it, the N64 controller just doesn't lend itself well to first person shooters. I also have to mention the fact that this game had an ad campaign which ran the tagline, John Romero is about to make you his bitch. Okay, that's actually hilarious. Drake of the 99 Dragons. Drake of the 99 Dragons is an action shooter game released for the Xbox in 2000. 2003, and it's very 2003. It seems obviously inspired by the many trench coat wearing, gun toting, kung fu action movies at the time, and an art style that looks a lot like something Gendy Tartofsky would come up with. You play as protagonist Drake, a member of the 99 Dragons clan. The clan is attacked and massacred along with Drake himself, but he's resurrected by a mysterious entity that binds two dragon tattoos on Drake's arms to his soul, granting him supernatural abilities. So far, that all sounds fine, even kind of cool, but there's one thing that that is way more important than all of that when it comes to video games. Gameplay. The main mechanic of the game is the aiming system where Drake's arms flail crazily around aiming at enemies at the same time you're meant to be doing cool jumps and wall runs and all that, but together it's just so erratic and messy making the main gameplay mechanic kind of sloppy and frustrating. Add a wacky camera and a ton of bugs and you got quite a mess here. You know, I never played this when I was a kid, but if I'm being honest just from looking at it, I think I probably would have really liked this game despite its flaws. Instead, I was busy playing Enter the Matrix, but I digress. Plumbers Don't Wear Ties Plumbers Don't Wear Ties is one of the most bizarre attempts at a video game ever conceived. Originally releasing on the 3DO in 1994, the game was marketed as an interactive romantic comedy and follows John, a plumber, and Jane, an office worker, presenting the player with choices that supposedly influence the course of their relationship. However, rather than featuring actual gameplay or animation, Plumbers Don't Wear Ties is almost entirely composed of still photographs accompanied by voiceovers. Were you raised in a barn? These are the most disgusting series of flat choices I have ever seen. Almost every part of this game is just a WTF moment because the narrative is insane. It feels like you're just watching a slightly interactive slideshow of some of the wackiest images ever with a ton of mixed in sexual innuendos and crude humor. To me, it's kind of like the video game version of The Room. It's so bad that it's actually entertaining because you never know what'll happen next. And would you believe that this game got a limited run re-release on modern consoles a couple years ago? Yeah, so now you can play Plumbers Don't Wear Ties on Switch. Great. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is considered one of the worst games in the NES library. In the game, you play as Jekyll making his way to his own wedding, trying to avoid various hazards so that he doesn't freak out and turn into Hyde. The gameplay is extremely difficult, not due to challenging puzzles or enemies, but because of its seemingly arbitrary and confusing nature. As Dr. Jekyll players must navigate a series of town levels while avoiding an array of bizarre enemies that don't even make sense, like bees, cats, and townspeople, any of which can cause a transformation transformation into Mr. Hyde, and the only weapon you have is your walking cane, which just does jack shit. The Mr. Hyde segments are a little more action oriented, and you actually have a weapon, which is nice, but they're also extremely hard and confusing, so it's really a lose-lose. E-Football in 2021, Konami rebranded Pro Evolution Soccer as eFootball and shifted to a free-to-play model. However, the launch of eFootball was just a colossal bomb. The game launched with numerous bugs and glitches, subpar graphics, and animations that were so comical and unrealistic they were memed to death. The bad physics, unresponsive controls, and a lack of content made it a stark departure from the depth and polish of the previous PES titles. And of course, the major issue that comes along with most free-to-play models is the microtransaction system, which which some players felt was way too invasive and affected the competitive balance of the game, like they always do. Basically, eFootball felt more like an unfinished product at launch rather than a full-fledged, innovative step forward for the franchise. Saints Row 2022 Another more recent title is Saints Row. 
This one actually hits close to home because the Saints Row franchise is near and dear to my heart. I clocked hundreds of hours playing the first three games, especially Saints Row 2. The series felt like the only legitimate competitor to GTA, but it didn't feel like a clone either. It had its own style and humor, focusing more on building up your gang and eliminating rival gangs. The humor did ramp up as the series went on, with Saints Row 3 almost being a parody of the first two games, and don't even get me started on Saints Row 4, which was just batshit crazy. I would have preferred they stuck with the tone of the second game, but but what can I say, they were all still fun as hell to play, especially with a co-op buddy along for the ride. Anyway, I'm waxing nostalgic here, but it's relevant because I'm a Saints Row fan and was excited when they announced a reboot to the franchise. Unfortunately, all we got was a mess. Saints Row was plagued with bugs and performance issues at launch. The game's world, while huge, felt lifeless and lacking the vibrancy of the previous games. One of the real issues here is the forced humor and unlikable characters. Honestly, this reboot kind of reminds me of Dead Rising 4, another franchise I absolutely loved, and then Dead Rising 4 came out, acting like a bit of a series reboot, but just totally missing the mark. Anyway, I've spent more time talking about other games than Saints Row here, but the fact is that Saints Row 2022 was just cruddy. Mighty Number no. 9 Mighty No. 9 was intended to be a spiritual successor to Mega Man, created by Keji Inafune, a former Capcom employee known for his work on the Mega Man games. The game was crowdfunded using Kickstarter and it raised $4 million, which was the largest amount of money raised for a game at the time. Unfortunately, the game suffered from unimpressive graphics, lackluster gameplay, and just failure to meet the polished standards expected from such a substantial funding. All of this was made worse by a crap show of a Kickstarter campaign. While it all seemed rosy at the start, the campaign soon became mired in controversy due to repeated delays in the game's release and a lack of transparency from the developers because of sparse and inconsistent updates that failed to provide concrete information or assurance about the project's progress. The project's backers were left in a frustrated limbo. The campaign also faced a lot of backlash over mismanaged stretch goals, with funds seemingly not translating into the promised game quality. This was all made worse by a hilariously bad trailer for the game. Hey, you, looking at the screen. Let me ask you a question. Do you like awesome things that are awesome? Then you gotta play this game, dude. It's freaking cool and crazy addictive, like popping bubble wrap addictive. See, that's your dash move. There's a short dash, a long dash, jump dash, spiral, slide. There's probably a dash that makes you breakfast. I don't know. Great idea. Wait, what? I also have to mention that the game included the majority of its backers in the end credits of the game, making them over four hours long. The longest of any credits in any media. That that's crazy. The Ninja Bread Man. Ninja Bread Man for the Wii released in 2007 and is now considered one of the worst games in the Wii's library. The game features a gingerbread man protagonist in a ninja costume, navigating through simplistic and poorly designed levels with the objective to defeat enemies and collect items. It was intended to capitalize on the unique motion controls of the Wii, but was instead panned for its unresponsive and clunky control scheme, which made the basic act of moving and attacking a real pain in the ass. The graphics and sound were considered subpar, even for the time, and it just had a lack of content, offering a very short short, frustrating playtime with no real replay value, not that you'd want to replay it anyway. Fast and Furious Crossroads this game is a predictably bad cash-in on the Fast and the Furious franchise that feels like it should have come out 12 years earlier. The driving, which is the whole point of the game, sucks. Everything feels buttery and the physics don't make any sense as you just bounce off everything. The core gameplay consists of just racing toward a target while avoiding enemies and then watching a cutscene and then repeating. That's pretty much it. The crazy thing is this game is only four hours long and a huge chunk of that is cutscenes. So this thing was priced at $60 for a couple of hours of gameplay and they had the balls to make a $90 deluxe version of the game that included a season pass. Absolutely insane. All right, tier four, Rogue Warrior. Rogue Warrior was a first person slash third person shooter released in 2009. Yeah, that was a trendy thing at the time where when you do certain actions like getting into cover or climbing ladders, it would switch to third person. Just stick to one, I say, but whatever. The game follows the story of a real life US Navy SEAL, Richard Demo Dick Marchinko, on a covert mission in North Korea. I can't help but feel that this was highly embellished. Well, the game had a slew of issues, including a shockingly short campaign that could be completed in just a few hours, lackluster and repetitive gunfight gameplay, and unchallenging AI. The worst, or best part of the game, depending on who you ask, is that Mickey Rourke plays the voice of Dick and just says the most insane one liners. Suck my balls, my hairy big balls, wrap them around your mouth. I'm gonna I mean, I don't know if they knew this was funny or not when they made it, but it's cracking me up. Tomb Raider, the Angel of Darkness. 
The Angel of Darkness released in 2003 with an attempt to reinvent the series with a darker tone and more complex narrative. However, it's often regarded as one of the weakest entries in the franchise due to a multitude of problems. The game departed from the exploration and puzzle solving elements that were staples of the series, instead introducing unwieldy stealth mechanics and an inconsistent plot. Its controls were unresponsive and cumbersome, particularly frustrating fans who were accustomed to the fluid movement of the previous titles. The character animations and the interactions with the environment were clunky as well. And this was the first game on the PlayStation 2. The controls and movement should be as smooth as ever. Well, they did add a jiggle effect to her boobs, so there's that. Batman Dark Tomorrow Batman Dark Tomorrow released in 2003 for the GameCube and Xbox. The game seems to be an attempt at making a Batman game in the same vein as the Arkham series that came out seven years later, but completely butchering the attempt. The main glaring issue with the game are the horrendous controls and movement coupled with a terrible fixed camera system. And what better way of showcasing these bad mechanics than the opening level where Batman is jumping across rooftops, a feat that seems almost impossible with these clunky controls. Once Batman gets onto street level, he's cramped into tight pathways and alleys that are confusing to navigate, and the combat is frustrating and repetitive with terrible AI. Plus, once you knock out an enemy, you'll have to cuff them with the bat cuffs so they'll stay down, making it really hard to fight multiple enemies at once. I could go on, but you get the idea. This game was actually meant to be an open world game, which seems inconceivable, apparently even to them, because they ended up scrapping the idea going for a more linear game. Man, Batman just couldn't get a break until finally Rocksteady found a great formula with the Arkham games, thank god. Postal 3 Postal 3 was just a disappointing mess. It released in 2011 and people were excited to finally get a third game. Unfortunately, the original Postal developers running with scissors weren't hands on and instead Russian developer Trash Masters took over. And let's just say things didn't go smoothly. The game was a hotbed of bugs, the controls felt sloppy, especially since they made it an over the shoulder third person game instead of the first person which everyone was used to from the first two games. And along with that they abandoned the whole open world sandbox style, making it more linear which is a a big mistake because that's the whole appeal to me in Postal 2. The graphics were pretty outdated for 2011 and the signature dark humor that Postal's known for just didn't land this time. The game is such a flop that Running With Scissors actually went on to disown the game and told people not to buy it. They eventually continued the series with Postal 4, ignoring the third game and making this entry the true successor to Postal 2. Leisure Suit Larry Box Office Bust Leisure Suit Larry is a strange game series that started in 1987 with Leisure Suit Larry in the Land of the Lounge Lizards. Yeah, say that five times fast. The series follows Larry Laffler, or one of his relatives depending on what game you play, as he attempts, usually unsuccessfully successfully to seduce women. The series has had its ups and downs, but definitely one of the downs is Box Office Bust, which was released in 2009 to overwhelmingly negative reviews. The story follows Larry Lovage, the original Larry's nephew. His uncle asks for his assistance, doing odd jobs around his adult film studio in Hollywood. The crazy thing about this game is it actually has some great comedic voice talent attached to it. Jay Moore, Artie Lang, Dave Attell, Carmen Electra and Shannon Elizabeth playing love interests, and even Jeffrey Tambor playing the old Larry. The story was written by Alan Covert, whose name isn't recognizable, but his face is, mostly from being in every Adam Sandler movie ever. The game was panned across the board with clunky controls, a camera that seemed to have a mind of its own, and graphics that would have looked dated years before it even came out. The humor, which should have been its saving grace, missed the mark completely, coming off as forced and offensive rather than witty and charming, and the gameplay itself was a buggy mess. It had you doing a bunch of monotonous tasks and featured platforming sections that felt like a chore due to the poor controls. But hey, boobs, right? Pac-Man Atari 2600 the Atari 2600 version of Pac-Man released in 1982. It was supposed to bring the arcade smash hit into living rooms, but it turned out to be a huge letdown. The problem was, it just didn't capture the magic of the arcade version. The graphics were so basic and flickery that it was tough to tell what was going on, and the iconic Waka Waka sound was replaced by this jarring buzz noise. <laughs> It's really not all that bad of a game for the 2600, but it's mostly notable due to the disappointing transition from arcade to console. Phoenix Games Phoenix Games is like the video game equivalent of a bad movie studio, right up there with LJN and Titus. They were a Dutch publisher that put out a bunch of super low budget titles for the PlayStation and PlayStation 2, and let me tell you, these are bad. We're talking bottom of the barrel graphics and animations that could make early 90s games look cutting edge, and just horrendous gameplay. They churned out games that seemed like they were knocked together over a weekend. A lot of their stuff was weird knockoffs of popular Disney movies or fairy tales, with cover art that was a clear attempt at baiting kids into thinking it was going to be something good, but then you just start playing and… yeah. 
These games were the kind you'd find buried in a bargain bin or gathering dust on a rental store shelf. For gamers who stumbled upon them, they offered a mix of confusion and a bit of a laugh at just how low effort they seemed. So Phoenix Games has sort of become a running joke in the gaming community when talking about publishers that seem to prioritize quantity over quality. Family Party, 30 Great Games Outdoor Fun. Yeah, that's the title. Well, Family Party 30 Great Games Outdoor Fun is a Wii game released in 2009, and it's kind of a knockoff of Wii Sports and Mario Party. There's not too much to say about it. It's just a collection of crappy mini games, all plagued with unintuitive and unresponsive controls. Fighter Within. Fighter Within was Ubisoft's attempt to jump on the motion controlled gaming bandwagon for the Xbox One using the Kinect. I'm going to be honest with you, I completely forgot the Kinect existed until I researched this game. Anyway, the game released in 2013, promising to deliver an immersive an intuitive fighting game experience where your body movements would translate into combat moves in the game. Hell yeah, that's what the Kinect is all about, baby. I want to feel like I'm really fighting. Instead, the game ended up having really unreliable motion detection. Players would throw a punch in real life and either nothing would happen in the game or the on-screen fighter would do something totally different, which is a big problem when that's the whole game. Graphically, Fighter Within looked okay, but it didn't help that the game's character roster and environments just lacked creativity, making it feel like a generic brawler with a motion control gimmick. I've heard some people say that the game isn't as bad as it's made out to be, especially if you stick with it and get used to the movements, but either way, it didn't look good for Microsoft when the game became a kind of anti-showcase for the Kinect. All right, and our last entry on tier four, Takeshi's Challenge. Known in Japan as Takeshi no Chojinjo, is a video game that's gained almost a cult-like status for being infamously bad. Released on the Famicom in Japan in 1986, it was designed by Japanese entertainer Takashi Kitano, who apparently didn't even like video games. The game's notorious for its bizarre and incredibly frustrating gameplay. It's got stuff like singing into a microphone on the second controller for karaoke sessions, waiting real-time actual hours in an in-game bar, and punishing players for just about everything, including hitting the wrong button, which could reset the whole game. That's really people's biggest gripe with the game. It's not the strange stuff you have to do, which in some ways is kind of innovative, but the fact that there's no clues whatsoever on what and when to do these things. Like, how are you supposed to know to divorce your wife and pay her alimony after quitting your job? Yeah, that's actually part of the story progression here. Takaji's Challenge is one of the weirdest games ever made for the era, and despite being labeled one of the worst games of all time, it's kind of awesome that it even exists. Okay, well, we made it through the first four tiers. Thanks for watching, and we'll finish it up with tiers 5 through 8 next week. A little bit of housekeeping real quick. Thanks to all the new subscribers for joining. This channel's grown so much in the last couple months, it's really hard for me to wrap my head around. But one of the consequences is that I'm a little slower at responding to comments, emails, messages... So bear with me, I try to read everything, but sometimes it is a lot to keep up with. Also for Patreon people out there, I really appreciate you guys and I'm currently working on more content for the Patreon. I've gotten a lot of requests to play more horror games on the Patreon, so I'm going to be doing those more regularly, but I also want to do content that feels like what you'd see on the YouTube channel, so I have an exclusive Iceberg video coming out soon for Patreon and I hope to make that a regular thing. I'm also going to try and set up a store to get some grief merch out soon as well. Anyway, I hate talking for this long, there's more things coming soon. Thank you, and this is Grief Speaking. Goodbye, friends. Uh